Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to, uh, I'm in a rather unaccustomed position that I'm actually going to be talking about books that I like rather than uh, ones that I don't like. Uh, this is a very hard for me to do, but I'll try it anyway. Uh, uh, now, the, the first book that I want to mention, uh, I unfortunately don't have a copy uh, to show you, but it's by T Tom Woods called The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. Now, what uh, Tom Woods argues in, in, this, in this book is that there's been a trend toward centralization in American history that's been very hostile to liberty. There's a continued trend toward increasing centralization of power in the federal government, increasing power for the government. And he points out that, uh, he, he emphasizes a, a counter trend in constitutional history. As you know, at the time the Constitution was adopted in 1787, uh, the Constitution, the people in favor of the Constitution were those promoting central government as opposed to the anti-federalists who feared that the Constitution would promote an overly powerful government. But Woods points out that even the centralizers of that time, the proponents of the Constitution, were themselves very anxious to limit the government by comparison with their with uh, later developments. They were in favor of limited government, and uh, he stresses particularly the importance of uh, the Jeffersonian tradition. That Jefferson believed, as shown in the uh, Virginia and Kentucky resolutions, that the states had the right to nullify or interpose uh, their, uh, if the laws were passed by Congress that they thought were unconstitutional. They had uh, ways of protesting. They would just hold that the law couldn't be applied in that state. And this wasn't, Woods points out, an extremist idea just promoted later by a, a few southern firebrands, but it was basic to the whole a Jeffersonian tradition. He contrasts this with a Hamiltonian tradition. Remember, Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson were both members of the first cabinet of George Washington, whereas Hamilton favored a central, more of a nationalistic trend where economic, particularly economic policy would be under the control of the government, the central government. The Jeffersonian tradition was one of opposition to such power and that liberty could be promoted only by having power dispersed among the states and the local communities. What goes on in the book to uh, emphasize the, impo uh, the importance of the war between the states, sometimes referred to as the Civil War, for consolidating the power of the central government. In, in the conflict, uh, this was the first time that direct military action was taken against civilians under uh, some of the generals, such as General Sherman and others. There was direct action taken uh, against civilians, and this has been a very bad precedent since then. It, uh, the Woods continues his account of uh, American history, again, stressing this theme of this centralizing state versus opposition to it, uh, especially emphasizing the role of the New Deal under Franklin Roosevelt in consolidating government power. Now, I think a good book to read along with uh, Tom Woods's book is a book called uh, How Capitalism Saved America. You can, this is one you can get uh, on sale today. And this is by Tom DiLorenzo, who's an economist and also historian. Like Woods, this, this is the reason I say the two fit together, Woods stresses this basic split in American history between the Hamiltonian centralizers and the Jeffersonian decentralizers or promoters of liberty. Uh, particularly important, according to Lorenzo, is uh, a follower of the Hamilton system, a, a very influential early 19th century uh, politician who was a uh, Senator, uh, Senator and 
one uh, uh, several times candidate for president, Henry Clay, remember him, he was the one who said he would, re- I'd rather be right than president, and he wound up being neither. Uh, but uh, Clay had what he called the American system, which was one in which the government would promote economic development through high tariffs, internal improvements, which would be uh, building canals and uh, other uh, roads and uh, various measures that he thought the free market wasn't adequate to develop the economy by itself. It would need the government to come in and and, uh, control matters. And uh, De Lorenzo points out, and this is his, what he's best known for as an uh, American historian, Clay's leading follower was Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln, throughout his career, emphasized that he was a disciple of Clay. And uh, De Lorenzo holds that what was fundamental in causing the Civil War was Lincoln's plans to centralize the government and the opposition to the high tariff policies he pursued uh, by the southern states that Lincoln said at the time secession was contemplated uh, he wasn't going to interfere with slavery in the states where it existed but if the southern states uh, refused to uh, remit the tariffs to the government then he would go right ahead and go in and enforce this so this was the key issue for Lincoln is what how could economic power be centralized in the national government? And the same policies, again, were continued after the, the war. And uh, one thing that both Di Lorenzo and Woods are very good on is emphasizing how the Reconstruction period right after the Civil War, which lasted from 1865 to 1876, was one of growth of government power and uh, De Lorenzo goes on to emphasize how this continued under Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt, and he draws some very interesting parallels between the New Deal of Franklin Roosevelt and the fascist uh, system of Benito Mussolini. Uh, remember, uh, in, although uh, fascism is now very much disliked by everyone. If you want to insult someone, you can just call them a fascist. It's a very good way of attacking them. In the 1920s and early 30s, Mussolini was very well regarded by large sections of the American public opinion. And that uh, De Lorenzo points out that in many ways, certain aspects of the New Deal, such as the uh, National Industrial Recovery Act, were modeled on Mussolini's system. Now, if we ask, if both these authors have stressed the growth of uh, central, the centralized power as a threat to liberty. Now, if we ask, how, what has been the main way in which central power has increased? What has been the main mechanism by which the state has increased its power throughout American history? I think the answer is clearly in in war, in preparation for war. And in this connection, I want to mention two books, uh, one of which I have here uh, by the uh, American uh, historian and economist Robert Higgs. Higgs. One is called Against Leviathan. This, again, is, if you allow me the hint, is one you can buy uh, afterwards at the table outside. And another book, also I don't have a copy of this, by Higgs uh, called The Resurgence of the Warfare State. Now, you probably, or many of you are familiar with Higgs's basic thesis is that during a war, the government increases its power and then even though once war ends, the uh, government will uh, reduce to a certain extent and will the wartime emergency regulations will no longer be enforced in force, the government never goes back to the previous level. There's always what he calls a ratchet effect by which government power continually increases so that each war is meant that the government becomes more and more powerful. And uh, one point that uh, 
Higgs is very good on in stressing is the role of the judiciary in this whole process of increasing government power. Uh, during World War I, for example, the uh, Supreme Court rejected out of hand all challenges to the constitutionality of the draft. That They said that even though this isn't uh, the Constitution, no word gives the government the power to draft people. Uh, uh, this didn't matter to the Supreme Court. Of course, the, there was a draft in the, under Lincoln as well. And now, one point that Higgs emphasizes is uh, a statement by Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was uh, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court for a long time, and by uh, conventional leftist scholars is considered the greatest, uh, of one of the, probably the greatest of all uh, modern jurists. And what Holmes said is, in one of his opinions, he said, well, if the government has the power to conscript people into the army, then surely it has the power to do anything less than that, so that people, say, couldn't protest against economic regulations and infringement of liberty, because if the government has the power to draft people, then can't it do, uh, say, if the government, say, I think the, case, the particular case where he said this involved the government closing off a uh, national park to people, said they didn't want people going into this area. So Holmes said, well, look, if the government can say, can draft you into the army, surely it can say to you, you can't go into a certain uh, part of public land. So the whole power, uh, the government can really, because of the power to draft people during the war, can really do anything at once. Now, another point Higgs stresses in his newest book, which is this one, uh, Resurgence of the War of the Warfare State, is that the prevalence of a certain mentality in the government in hand, dealing with foreign affairs, and here he follows the uh, sociologist C. Wright Mills, and he calls this crackpot realism. And what this uh, concept involves is that the people in, in charge of the government will say only they are capable of handling the realities of power politics, that the people as a whole are too uh, idealistic or too unwilling to confront the hard realities of the situation, and only the people who are steeled to the nature of emergencies can really handle the situation. And the reason Mills and uh, C. Wright Mills and Higgs call this crackpot realism is that it doesn't consider any options other than military ones. It's simply if, say, uh, if, say, possibly a certain country is building up arms, well, then the thing to do is to go in and drop a nuclear bomb on them in case to prevent the possibility that they might develop nuclear weapons. So we have to go in and say, let Iran or other countries have it first. And there's no willingness to consider any other ways of dealing with a situation than a strictly military one. So Higgs, uh, I think, very strongly argues that this is a way in which uh, centralized power has developed through this uh, constant use of war. Now, one question one might ask is, uh, why has there not been very effective opposition to this centralizing policy that's emphasizing war. And uh, one place we might look to such opposition usually has been uh, the American right, right wing fo uh, forces, the American conservative movement. And certainly during uh, the period uh, leading up to World War II, the, what Murray Rothbard used to call the old right was very strongly in opposition to uh, bellicose foreign policy and was emphasized, emphasized the need for uh, peaceful policy and, as, and uh, realized that uh, war-like policy is one that will only enhance the growth of the state. And so the question comes up, why is uh, current American conservatism uh, unable to mount such a stand? And here I want to refer to a book by Lou Rockwell called uh, Speaking of Liberty, which is a very good book. It's a collection of various 
columns and speeches that he's given. It's a very substantial volume of well over 400 pages. And one, there are many uh, different themes in the book, but one that I particularly want to stress in this connection is that according to Lou Rockwell, uh, one reason the American cons- conservative movement has failed to respond adequately to the challenge, if we can use Toynbee's famous uh, terms of a challenge and response. Why has the American conservative not responded adequately to the challenge of militarism? Is that there's been an emphasis in post World War II conservatism on conservatism just as a state of mind or a tradition rather than a system of principles. We don't, as in the old right before, have a consistent set of principles opposing the growth of state power, but we just have a trend, a sort of a, a frame of mind in which people, say, are opposed to too much change or like things the way they've been, as they've known them, say, the way they were growing up. They don't want things to be changed much, but such a disposition isn't a real substitute for an uh, ideological set of beliefs. And, uh, uh, Lou particularly emphasizes the role of Russell Kirk's very influential book, The Conservative Mind, in this, uh, in this connection. That Kirk stressed very much that conservatism as a disposition, and he opposed ideology. Thus, he could at one point say that both Ludwig von Mises and Karl Marx were equally ideologist, which of course in his terms is a very bad thing to be. One, according to Kirk, one doesn't want to have a system of, uh, of ideas. Uh, we could also think, for example, uh, Michael Oakeshott, who was a very influential conservative philosopher, once uh, reviewed a Hayek, Friedrich Hayek and said, well, the trouble with Hayek is he doesn't believe in, he, he's right to be oppose economic planning, but he has a, a plan to get rid of planning, and this is no good. We can't have a plan to get rid of planning. We just have to go according to the, uh, we just have to sort of go according to how things develop without any fixed principles. So we have here an example of, I think, the same sort of mentality uh, Lou Rockwell is rightly combating in his book. Now, if we agree that uh, with Lou Rockwell on the need for an ideological system, one based on reason, then the question comes up, how can reason, how can a, re- a, a belief in reason or a competence in reason be adequately defended philosophically? And here I want to mention that the last of the books, uh, one by uh, Hans Hoppe, who spoke earlier today. This is called, this again, you can get uh, uh, for sale here. This is called uh, The Economics and Ethics of Private Property. And, uh, I'll just, one theme that uh, Hans Hoppe brings out in this book, I think very effectively, is that one way in which opponents of the free market have attempted to combat the arguments in favor of the market is simply to reject reason altogether. You see, this fits in with what uh, Lou Rockwell was saying in a certain trend in American conservatism. So that uh, they tended to say, uh, the, well, if arguments show that uh, socialism won't work, then we have to just go by feeling and get rid of uh, reason altogether. We would just say everything is contextual or relative, and we would reject the need for fixed principles. And I think uh, what Hans does very effectively in the book is to say that this kind of view is really, it is, is in a certain way self-contradictory that, say, people who say that, in, say that don't believe in reason intend their own views to be, they think their own views are true. They think that uh, it's true that there are no truths. Or so that what Hans develops in se- several of the essays in the book, I think very effectively, is to show how our very in- engagement in any kind of action or argument 
in, has certain presuppositions to it, and that to deny these presuppositions, say, to say that change just takes place randomly or that there aren't fixed laws of things is really contradicting our own uh, making a, a s- statements, that the very fact that we're able to make certain statements or act in ways presupposes uh, certain things about the world. And Hans goes argues that we can, or claims that we can get an entire ethical system and theory of knowledge based on this fundamental fact. So, uh, as you can see, I've managed to come up with at least a few books that I like. Uh, uh, these are just a f- uh, certainly uh, it's much easier to come up with books that I don't like but I'm always happy to find ones that I recommend and these are six books that I recommend very highly to you thanks very much